Hello. Greetings. Welcome back. Yes, welcome to Dream Idiots. My name is Morris. The other fellow is Brian. Each week we tell each other stories to amuse ourselves <laughs> and hopefully bring you along for the ride. Uh, Brian, do we have any updates or information for the folks? Uh, we do. It should be explained. It, it occurred to me recently that we haven't been crystal clear on this one one point. We two, we do tell two stories every week. Uh, the other person doesn't know what, what's what's coming. So it's a, it's a surprise for them and for you. Um, yes, if it you is. Are, if you are listening to us, um, you can check us out at dreamidiots.com. We have, there's a whole back catalog now of 126 episodes, plus some bonus things out there. Uh, there's merch there as well. If you can, we'd appreciate it if you'd shoot us five stars and give us a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podchaser. We're on 8, 10, 12 different platforms, I believe. Um, give us five stars and give us a review. That helps us somehow. I'm not really sure how. Uh, you can drop us a line at Dream Idiots Podcast at Gmail if you have a story idea or a curse word for us to investigate. Uh, and we're also on Instagram and Facebook um, at Dream Idiots. So check us out and thanks for tagging along. Yay. Uh, you mentioned you had an update before we started. What is the I update? I do on? have one update just last week uh, in Boston on uh, last either Friday or Saturday night. Uh, they held the the first in person Ig Nobel Prize ceremony uh, since right. since COVID since 2019. So um, I've covered this at least once in depth, and then we've mentioned it a couple times in past in the in, in passing. So the Ig Nobel Prize uh, is uh, a scientific uh, based award, an award ceremony handed out to researchers and scientists and academics. Uh, who first endeavored to make us laugh and then make us think. The first uh, I first discovered uh, this prize probably a decade ago. There was a guy who uh, basically did research to determine uh, if if there was any sort of link in um, sort of um, you know old Roman era uh, statues of you know um, Michelangelo's David. Uh, apparently in statues where there, where there are nudes. So obviously there are nude babies and nude women and nude men in all kinds of different art in the, all the sculptures of nude men, the left testicle is always bigger and lower than in these statues. And this one scientist tried to figure out if there was, if that's was that, what actually went on at the time. Was this uh, something that was anatomically correct for the time? Um, interesting topic, weird topic to dive into. And so that guy won an award one year and, um, and so at this event now, it's been going on for 34 years. Uh, if, for this live event, they actually encourage folks to bring paper airplanes to the proceedings to, to throw them. And they also have uh, Miss Sweetie Poo. So every year for the event, they have a, an eight-year-old girl who is selected <laughs> to be the, the time enforcer if you, start, if you ramble on too long. And so if, you, <laughs> if your speech goes, go, goes on for a little bit too long, she'll walk up to the front of the stage and yell repeatedly, please stop. I'm bored until you stop. <laughs> uh, I didn't realize they, um, they actually have a, they, there's a public call for, so for a new Miss Sweetie Pooh every year. And so this year they, they put out an advertisement that they needed one for this year's ceremony. Uh, qualifications to be Miss Sweetie Pooh is you have to be in the Boston area. You have to have ice water in your veins and you must be a tough minded, cute eight year old girl who has astounding depths of social wisdom. So anyway, <laughs> so, um, so pretty funny stuff. Um, actually, some of it does kind of have some rigor and structure of true research. I'm not going to read all of the results, but some of these are, are pretty good from this year's ceremony. The Peace Prize went to a man named B.F. Skinner uh, for experiments to see the, to test the feasibility of housing live pigeons inside missiles to guide the flight paths of missiles. <laughs> uh, the prize in medicine went to a team from Switzerland, Germany, and Belgium. Uh, they um, they sought to demonstrate that there's a link uh, that that fake medicine, fake medicine, so placebos that cause painful side effects can be more effective than fake medicine that does not cause painful side effects, which is kind of interesting when you think about huh. it. Um, so if, if, you know, if you're being given a placebo, but you're told a, a side effect, you know, there is this side effect that the, the brain will manufacture that side effect in order to buy into the placebo effect, I guess. 
the award for probability went to a European team. Um, they, you know, you can call this the uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern test. So if you take a quarter and you flip it a hundred thousand times in a row, it's going to come down not perfectly 50, 50, but really close to 50, 50. They sought to discover if you flip a coin, will it, if, if you start on heads, will it come back to heads when you, when you're done? And so they flip they flipped a coin over three hundred and fifty thousand times to test whether this Good theory was, was, was true or not. Um, prize in um, demography. Um, this team sought to prove or disprove the notion that there is this this, this idea that folks in red zo- I'm sorry blue zones across the world have um, greater longevity, and they sought to prove that. The longevity in in some in some of these areas that report, you know, lots of folks over the age of 100. The reason they have they're skewed so much is that these are areas that have terrible record keeping. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so these folks aren't actually 115; they're actually 88. Uh, and then um, the best one in physiology went to a team from Japan, uh, and they sought to discover. Um, which mammals are capable of breathing through their mouth, but also through their anus. And apparently some can. Hmm. So anyway, I, I just didn't think this is a kind of a hilarious um, event. And uh, I think I'm doing that as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> worth sharing. So that the guy with the pigeons, that wasn't the BF Skinner. Cause he's, you know, dead. I think the BF Skinner Skinner's box. That's not the same. BF I know the- Skinner. Well, it um it may well be because um I it may have been updated stuff start, started by him. I don't know. Oh, okay. Well, we'll have to look that up. So not thank sure. you, anyway, Ryan, for that update yeah, on the uh, you know, Ig Nobel Prize. Yes, de- definitely a, a funny event. I mean, if I've ever found myself in Boston in September, I would definitely go to that. It seems pretty, pretty cool. All right, uh, it is an odd numbered episode, so you get to go first. All right, what you got for us. So um, we're going back to the Civil War era this week uh, for my story. And so throughout the history of armed conflict, um, obviously there's been a lot of armed conflict. Um, People fighting people either in close, you know, up close hand-to-hand combat or shooting them from a distance or bombs being dropped from way above. Uh, But another less heralded, but certainly uh, effective way to engage in combat is to attack infrastructure. And there are tons of stories about um, attacking water supplies, attacking supply lines. Hitler famously learned nothing from Napoleon when they both tried to charge into Russia in, in winter, right? That's the old sort of joke meme story. Uh, you don't, you don't have to, don't have to fight an enemy if they're cold and starving. You just have to wait. You know, mm-hmm. there's no no point in fighting the Chippewa Indians or whatever the local tribe is when you can just give them blankets and wait until spring, right? It's sadistic and it's cruel, but it's very, very effective. So this is another perhaps similar story in that in that vein. Uh, James J. Andrews was born in Kentucky um, in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, he was a, served as a, a secret agent and a scout uh, for Tennessee. Um, and he spent his time, you know, just prior to the civil war and in, in the early, early months of the civil war, kind of on, on both sides, he would go back and forth. Obviously this is brother, brother versus brother, father versus son. Everyone looked the same. Everyone dressed the same. Everyone spoke the same. And so for some folks, it was comparatively easy. If you were a white man, you could go back and forth. And if you, were, you know, weren't engaged in armed conflict, you could sort of be anyone you needed to be. And he was definitely, uh, you know, that that type. But he definitely sided with the North. He got to know uh, Major General Don Carlos Buell. And in the spring of 1862, Buell's about to um, depart for Nashville to engage in combat. But uh, Andrews comes up with this idea and presents it to Buell that says, I've got an idea. Let's um, I mean, ha- let's engage in some carnage here and and um, see what we can do to mess up supply lines and transportation. I want to go go you know sneak across into the south. I want to steal a train and drive it north, and then uh, along the way just wreak havoc, destroy whatever we can whatever we can on the way out. Oh, and by the way, I, I have a I have a train engineer 
in Atlanta, who's, you know, he's a, a Southerner, but he's willing to defect to the Union. Uh, he's he's going to give us our train. We have to have a crew in order to assist running the train because it's a multi, multi-person multi task. You have to have several guys there with you. And we're going to burn bridges and tear up track and just do it, everything that we can. So Buell says, great, let's go for it. They, they pull, pull together a, um, a small team of folks um, uh, just eight men, they move across, uh, into the South, uh, and they're going to head down to Marietta, Georgia, uh, and they make it when they get there. Andrews finds out this, this engineer has quote been pressed into service elsewhere. So he's not available to drive the train. He asks the rest of his Raiders, his little crew there, anyone else know how to drive a train? None of them did. Hmm. So they call the raid off. Um, two of the Raiders at one point were confronted by Confederate soldiers. They were trying to cut telegraph lines. And, um, this is, you know, this is sort of begins as a comedy of errors and it kind of just gets worse. Um, they're stopped and pretend to be, um, wiremen working on the line and the soldiers go, Oh, okay. Okay. Which, you know, by all means proceed with, with what you were doing and, and the soldiers wander off. So, um, but because this winds up being a failure, all these guys do you know, wind up heading back to the north, having not absconded with a train. Um, but they decide, you know what, this maybe this wasn't such a great idea. And none of them, you know, they all think this is a bad idea. You know, and one added, quote, he felt at the time he was in the enemy's country as though he had a rope around his neck, unquote. So Yikes. Andrews still likes this idea. They all get out, you know, this first time and uh, he still you know serving as a civilian scout he's he's not actually armed he's not you know he's not a combatant uh and a kind of a part-time spy and he proposes uh another raid to try to destroy parts of the western uh, and atlantic railroad because he, he thinks this, this is going to be useful to uh, monkeying up supplies into chattanooga the area between georgia and um in tennessee so uh he starts recruiting men again um winds up pulling in 22 volunteers from three different Ohio regiments. And um, he tells them, okay, we're going to meet, we're headed back to Marietta, Georgia. We're going to meet there by midnight on April 10th. They get slightly delayed because of weather, um, but they all, all head off in small groups of, you know, two, three or four, all dressed as civilians and they all um, head, head South. Um, one group apparently, you know, in one account says they um, didn't make it across because they overslept, which just is probably a lie. <laughs> My alarm clock didn't go off. I had a power outage. Um, uh, two of them, Samuel uh, Llewellyn and James Smith, um, didn't make it because, as was the custom at the time, you know, if a Confederate colonel, Confederate general just saw you and you were walking around and who are you? Uh, they were just conscripted quickly and forced to join a Confederate art, art, artillery unit. You know, quit here. You know, here's a cannon. Man this cannon. And they went, uh, oh, oh, we better do as we're told. Otherwise, they will just kill us. So Llewell Llewellyn and Smith didn't make it. So the plan is to steal a train on the run north toward Chattanooga. And they're just going to do whatever do whatever they can to uh, to deal, you know, to to screw up infrastructure. You know, hopefully burn a bridge, take take down every stitch of telegraph wires they possibly can, uh, and then hopefully make it back up to uh, the north on the outskirts of Chattanooga and rejoin uh, General Mitchell's army there. So at this time, this is April of 1862, so early on in the war, railways they didn't didn't have dining cars. They, they, you know, dining cars were not in use yet, and so if you were on a passenger train. They had you know, railroad timetables included stops for rest and water and for meals. So these guys head down and they decide, okay, we're, we're going to catch up um, for the trains come through at Big Shanty, Georgia. Big Shanty later later changed its name to Kennesaw, Georgia. Hmm. And and they chose they chose Big Shanty because they were pretty well convinced that there wasn't a telegraph office there. So um, if they do steal a train there, it's going to be hard to get the word out quickly um, about the theft. There were, in, in at least one report, there it, it turns out they may have been wrong because someone does report having <laughs> having taken down telegraph lines in Big Shanty, Georgia. So they make it down there. Um, they are about 
um i think eight i think it's either 17 or 18 of the original 22 make it there april 12th 1862 and uh there's a regular morning passenger train from atlanta um being pulled by the locomotive the general pulled in there and stopped for breakfast at the Lacey hotel so they d d train d plane disembark whatever you know disembark. passengers disembark everyone gets off the train and um and basically head to the Lacey hotel which is presumably either right next to the tracks or very very close to the tracks and um this you know this team of uh, <laughs> uh you know then sets to to steal the train they disconnect the the passenger cars completely but they keep three box cars and the engine and then the the uh, the tender cars where all the all the fuel is for the engine 1862 it's probably i, I can't imagine this is coal this is probably just um probably just full of wood for burning you know and fueling the uh fueling the train so everyone's in the hotel having breakfast it's so close by presumably they you know the folks there heard the train start up because this is again 175 <laughs> years ago so I think it's loud as fuck in all, you know, pr you know, presumably, um, the thing starts moving and again, top speed for a train of this vintage and a, in a dead straightaway is like 40 miles an hour. This area, you know, Northern Georgia is hilly and windy. Absolute maximum top speed is like 20 miles an hour. Average speed, more like 15 miles an hour. Train starts moving. The train's conductor, a guy named William Fuller. And two other uh, men realize what's what's going on, and they chase after the train on foot uh, yeah. because it's within sight, right? It's just you know it's it's just pulled away, and it's whatever it's a mile and a half. It's it, but they know what's happened. They start sprinting down the tracks. Um, on a side track, they find um, a hand car, one of those old style. Uh -huh. you know, I, I feel uh. like Mickey Mouse or someone's you know, there are many, many cartoons, Bugs Bunny, maybe where they have the seesaw thing, you know, you know, where, do you, where two people get on either side and, and power the thing. They grab a hand car, um, that's being, it's being uh, operated by a work crew there and they basically give chase. So again, these trains are averaging 15 miles an hour and they're able to, um, you know, actually be, you know, maintain reasonably close uh, distance to to the the, um, the general on his way out of town. Andrew's hope or his intention is to stop periodically. Of course, stopping a train is a time consuming and lumberous task, but he wants to stop and rip up tracks and clear a bridge and burn the bridge down behind him. But he's aware of the fact that, oh, we're being pursued uh, in fairly close proximity. They cruise through the town of um, Etowah, and the raiders look over and notice another locomotive that's there on a sidetrack, a locomotive called the Yona, Y-O-N-A-H. And Andrew said, well, we, you know, we should probably stop here and set that locomotive on fire. But there's a whole crew of um, workers there, um, railway workers there. And we know what, you know, they're unarmed, but there's there'll be like a firefight to even get to this locomotive. It's not worth it. We're going to keep on trundling down the, down the track. They are taking down telegraph wires uh, now and again as they can. So they have all these, all these guys are on, on this train, um, but they have stolen a regularly scheduled train on a railroad with only one track. And so what they realize is they kind of have to keep that train's timetable. They can't, they can't be gunning it out of the South. They have to sort of try to blend sure. in and match the timetable. Cause again, one track. So um, if they reached a, a stopping point ahead of schedule, um, they had to wait until the scheduled Southbound trains pass them before they could keep going North. Otherwise there'd be a, a head on collision. Andrews tells station masters that he that he passes you know as they're as they're going north that well this is a this is a special northbound ammunition train we're uh, we're under under the command of General Beauregard uh, we're trying to get all this stuff up to forces fighting the Union closer to Chattanooga we know Chattanooga is about to be attacked and this story actually flew most of the time um and you know for the station masters that are out there that Andrews came across because he had cut telegraph wires. Uh, they they bought the story, 
but it started to have no impact uh, as he got further and further north because those telegraph lines were working and dispatchers there are, are, are under orders to give um, basically give priority to trains that are headed south because the city of Chattanooga is being evacuated. Um, and so they're trying to get everyone out, out of town. So any train coming south uh, is given priority. And so Andrews and the Raiders are being held up now and again. So they get delayed at the town of Kingston, waiting, 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 um, you know, south of Chattanooga. Um, and that's when they realize, oh, you know, we're, we're being chased and this guy's going to going to catch up to us. Um, Fuller is, is chasing them down. The locomotive that Andrews failed to destroy, uh, when Fuller comes along there, he go, oh, he realizes, oh, wait. The Yona is going to be faster. So he they dump the hand car and he hops in the the Yona um locomotive <laughs> and grabs you know, basically commandeers, you know, some of the guys that are there that are working. You know, come to me and I, I need your help. We're, we're, we're chasing down uh, a unionist and we're gonna, you know, chase him down and we're gonna kill him. So the Yona now is is um you know chasing him down. But they reach a point in Fuller reaches a point in the railway railway where um, Andrews did actually manage and his team they did manage to hop down and destroy enough of the tracks that uh, Fuller can't keep going north. So they hop down again and now they're on foot. But they quickly commandeer another locomotive called the William R. Smith, which is also on on a side track. But um, because um, it's on on a sidetrack. It's it's basically a, a train that is a a southbound locomotive, and so um, Andrews had, had passed it. Um, but when Fuller gets on it, he starts driving the train, chasing Andrews, but he's driving it backwards. Mm -hmm. So so there are there are locals here that are looking up and going, wait, there's a locomotive and and the tender car because you have to have the fuel going at speed backwards up the track. Um, again. Andrews is doing all that he can to destroy things on his way, but having limited success because someone is bearing down behind him. Um, finally, even though they were able to destroy a few things uh, with moderate success, uh, at, finally at milepost 116.3, just outside Ringgold, Georgia, um, but 18 miles short of Chattanooga, the general runs out of fuel and Andrew and all of his men pop off and just disperse. They just run. Within a couple of weeks, they are all gathered up, um, and they, you know, the Confederate Confederacy charges all of them with acts of unlawful belligerency. <laughs> Sorry, started laughing. Quote acts of unlawful belligerency, <laughs> um, and because they were unlawful com combatants, and this is what happened at the time, uh, they were tried in military courts. They had, I think. Um, captured all but one or two of them um andrews is found guilty he is executed by hanging on june 7th 1862 in, in atlanta and seven others who had been transported to knoxville were also convicted as spies they were later returned to atlanta and also hanged their bodies were just dumped in unmarked graves um in atlanta they were later reburied uh and given gravestones in chattanooga national cemetery the the, um, the rest of those that were captured, um, you know, another ten or so, um, were, they were definitely worried about being executed as well. They plotted an escape, and eight of them succeeded, um, to, you know, in, in their escape from getting out of jail. They split up quickly. Tra most of them traveled for the hundreds of miles back to the north, kind of traveling in pairs. Um, you know, made it back to Union lines. Two of them were actually aided by slaves and a couple of union sympathizers. And they were two, um, two of the group also hopped on a piece of wood or something. They floated down the Chattahoochee river until they reached the, <laughs> um, the union blockade at the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so they were rescued and sent back to the North as well in the, uh, in the days and weeks subsequent to that, they were basically lauded as heroes and went to a ceremony at the White House where they all met Abraham Lincoln. And um, so the event itself was not the wild success in terms of actually destroying things that it may have been, but um, you know, definitely sort of an interesting, interesting story. 
and two of the men who were who were not um, awarded any you know, not given any credit at the time were actually uh, awarded in July of this year. There was a ceremony at the White House with Joe Biden, and their ancestors were there to receive an award for their uh, heroism because they were they were, they were somehow they were overlooked at the time. So anyway, this this story is called the 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 great Locom locomotive chase. It was actually turned into a film. A Disney I was film. about to say <laughs> a, Di a Disney film in the 50s, yeah. but if the sort of slapsticky yeah. nature of it, especially with the hand car um, and then the big ass locomotive going backwards up the track, if it feels sort of slapsticky, it was originally portrayed on the film in, uh, in film in 1927. It's a Buster Keaton film just called The General. Um, oh yeah, sure. Where, where I where I think he portrays the, or I think he's Fuller, he's um, the train. yeah, the, the the engineer. Um, but definitely, you know, sort of a funny random story I'd never heard heard of before or seen before. I was about to say that it's it feels like the next Coen Brothers or Wes Anderson film. Right, right. Or... <laughs> That's good stuff. I'd never heard about that. My uh, my Civil War knowledge is is woefully lacking and i'd I'd never heard of the great locomotive chase what's i mean the civil war i mean i know a tiny bit uh it seems like in virtually every respect it is as complex if not more complex than world war ii or anything you know anything else and it's also so far removed in terms of time that records are so weird and so there's just a whole just a ton of stuff that went on then that um you know you would have to be a full-time historian to even begin to understand it just very very complex yeah somebody get on that yeah very cool thank you brian yeah. that's awesome and uh do we continue with a curse word of the week curse word is ever heard of a knocker upper and this is not a pregnancy joke uh is that a like when you when you flip a house <laughs> <laughs> no no so uh 19th century probably early part of the 20th century a knocker upper was a was a profession at least a part-time profession uh in the days before alarm clocks there were people that you could pay <laughs> to come around your house either with a pea shooter or a very very long piece of bamboo uh that would bang on your window and wake you up oh so you, so you get to work on time <laughs> so literally a literally a knocker upper <laughs> to wake you up Knocker upper. I'd not heard of that one. That is a good one. And you know, it we all we all can have jobs, so that's that's a good one. Um, are we ready for my story today? Let's go. All right. This story is the result of a listener's request from Marvin in San Antonio. Not only did he suggest it, but he helped me organize it and even right, listen well. to portions of an early draft. So big thanks, Marvin. And I would like to say that he is in no way responsible for the five horrible bits I'm going to inflict upon you, Brian, and the listener, <laughs> starting at the bottom of page one of my script through about the middle of page two. With that vaguely worded threat, let's get started. Have you heard of Dr. Jean Le Eugene Landy, Brian? Dr. Eugene Landy? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Dr. Eugene Landy was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on November 26, 1934. He wasn't born a doctor. He was a regular little baby. The doctor part came later. His parents, Jules and Frida, were both psychologists. At the age of five, Eugene took an IQ test at the University of Pittsburgh. He supposedly scored about 150 points, which is about 10 points south of the genius level. Regular schooling didn't mesh well with Eugene's brains, though. Dyslexia was the reason given for his dropping out of school in the sixth grade. He didn't want to follow his parents into the field of psychology. Instead, he did what all highly gifted people do. He tried to break into show business. <laughs> In the mid-1950s, at the age of 16, Landy produced a nationally syndicated show for teens on the radio, amongst other odd jobs in the business. He worked with fellow Pittsburgher George Benson, a jazz guitarist. Mm-hmm. Benson cut his first single, and I didn't know this, at the age of nine on the RCA <laughs> wow. Victor label. Landy became Benson's manager a year later. By my calculations, Landy was 14 years old at the time. A 14-year-old manager for a 10-year-old client. Brian, that's a sitcom. <laughs> 
Benson later mentioned a general distrust of his manager that developed when the guitarist's, quote, people had to sign a power of attorney, and Landy started receiving all of Benson's incoming mail. So he was up to something. Right. Landy also later produced a Frankie Avalon single. His radio career didn't pan out, so Landy finally went back to school, specifically Los Angeles City College, where he own, earned an associate's degree in chemistry. Uh, an associate's degree is the one that's not quite a bachelor's degree, somewhere between a high school degree and a bachelor's degree. Brian, the mascot for Los Angeles City College are the Cubs. Okay. Now, if you were a student there, you might convince your fellow students to go out for the night on the town by saying, Let hit, let's hit the blanks, blanks. They're the mm. Cubs. Mm -hmm. Let's hit the clubs, Cubs. Oh. We're in that we're in that section that I warned you about. Okay. <laughs> Landy then attended medical school at the National <laughs> Autonomous University in Mexico City. I I never heard Great of name. <laughs> the school mascot there is the Puma. So Brian, someone attending medical school there who likes to do bad Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonations while diagnosing fellow classmates might say to another student, "It's not a blank, blank." It's not a blank blank. It's not a Tuma Puma. Oh, God. <laughs> Landy probably didn't have time to attend home games of the UNAM Pumas football team, given the crammed schedule for medical students. Mm -hmm. That schedule was rendered moot owing to a case of dysentery, so devastating that he dropped out and switched to psychology instead. Landy literally shit himself into another profession. <laughs> He returned to the U.S. and earned a B.S. in psychology from Cal State Los Angeles in 1964. Brian, the mascot at Cal State Los Angeles is the Golden Eagle. So if you were a student asking another student if what they were doing was against the law, you might ask them, is that blank blank? Is that legal eagle? Very good, Brian. At the University of Oklahoma, Landy successfully earned both his master's and doctoral degrees by 1968. He no doubt arranged for the occasional Sooner Nooner while at Oklahoma. <laughs> After a stint in the Peace Corps, Landy returned to Southern California to work as a drug counselor at L.A. Harbor Hospital, part of the UCLA system. He also taught part-time at the San Fernando Valley State College, now known as Cal State University Northridge. The mascot there, Brian, is the Matador. If you were a student here and you wanted to blast your classmate for dressing sloppily and wearing clothes whose colors clashed, you might say, you're a blank, blank. Mm, matador. Uh, matador. 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 I have no idea. You're an eyesore, Matador. <laughs> okay, Brian, I'm, I'm done with all that nonsense. <laughs> okay, <the> foolishness. <laughs> In his practice, Landy touted what he called 24-hour therapy, which is pretty much what it sounds like. In this form of treatment, the client essentially voluntarily surrenders control to their therapy team. Every minute of the day is monitored by the team, every action controlled. This developed out of Landy's 1968 postdoctoral work in Rancho Santa Fe, where he worked on a, quote, marathon therapy approach, where he controlled a group of clients for a day or more. He wasn't satisfied that he had little control over his clients at night, so he implemented evening group sessions and answered calls at all hours of the night from those needing help. His approach fell under the umbrella of, quote, milieu therapy, a designation for long-term group therapy where the individuals take responsibility for their own actions and follow group rules. Patients with seniority in the group are supposed to guide new patients into group rules and punishments for disobeying them. Patients who look the other way and allow inappropriate behavior are punished as well. This is an arrangement that should last somewhere between 9 and 18 months. Now, if this sounds familiar, and it might sound familiar, taken to its extreme, extreme I think the rehab group Synanon, which we've talked about here mm -hmm. before based in Southern California, could be labeled as a form of milieu therapy. There seems to be no indication that Landy's method incorporated anything resembling the insidiously harmful and violent 
game as seen in synonym circles. You remember we've talked about the game right, before right. where, where just, it starts where just, with right. Yeah, starts with emotionally basement, ripping into right. someone and then ends up in a boxing match of some type. Now, Landy was a busy fella in the early 70s. In addition to his therapy work, he wrote a book on hippie slang called The Underground Dictionary. <laughs> Each entry was accompanied by designation as to the origin of the word or phrase. Here's the designation index. All of these are in parentheses. Capital letter B. What do you think that stands for as to where the word comes from? B. Brian, it stands for black. It stands for black. Okay. So you can kind of see where this is going. A lowercase d in parentheses stands for... Lowercase d in parenthesis? Mm -hmm. Yep. Divorce? Where it comes from? Drug user. The slang comes from a drug user. So I guess you can probably hint upon what a lowercase h in parenthesis stands for. Hispanic? Homosexual. Homosexual. Well. Lowercase m, Brian. The word comes from a lowercase m group, which are... Mexican? Motorcycle groups. Motorcycle. (laughs) God. A lowercase M E D in parenthesis. The word comes from M E D. Medical, scientific, or chemical personnel. I'm not quite sure what chemical personnel means, but it comes from the medical field. It's where okay. these slang words come from. A lowercase M U, the subculture that gives us this curse, this, uh, Slang word. Musician. M-U. Musicians. Very good. This is a double, a lowercase p in parenthesis. The word comes from. It's a, it's a double. What do you mean? It's, it's a double. It, there's two groups that's represented by a lowercase p and they're related. Prisoners and police oh. give us the slang for this word. And finally, a lowercase pr. What subgroup gives us these, these, this word? Pr. Hmm. I don't know. No idea. Prostitutes. Oh, of course. Now, this was courtesy of the Internet Archive. I actually downloaded a copy of the book and flipped through it. So I've got some definitions. Let's see if you can figure out <laughs> what he what Landy's on to. Here's the phrase that he that he has in his dictionary. Support your local travel agent. What do you think that's slang for? Support your local travel agent. Mm-hmm. Your, your, your local drug supplier? Your local oh. drug dealer. That is okay. correct, because they send you on a trip, man. Oh, okay. Here's another phrase in his dictionary. Flea powder. Oh, I've heard that before. Flea powder, is, is that just, co- just cocaine? It's actually poor quality narcotics of any kind. Oh, okay. you're just taking flea powder. Okay. Brian, how about the phrase hand slap? Like like um, slap on the wrist, like a. Not quite. No, I don't know. Here's how he defines hand slap: handshake that originated in the black community. One person puts a hand oh, out, uh, palm up, and the other <laughs> slaps it. Done as a greeting or sign of approval. <laughs> often accompanied by the expression "Give me five or give me some skin." He is defining a high five. Yeah. Two more. My favorite of the group. Well, these are both my favorite. The term fish heading for the piddle. (laughs) P-I-D-D-L-E. Fish heading for the piddle. piddle. Uh, Fish (laughs) head. Fish. I have no idea. It's a great expression, though. I like it. It is. It's when you surrender to the police or you go to the hospital to withdraw from drugs. Oh. So you you seek out help from from the authorities, either police-wise or... Fish heading for the piddle. Right. And fish heading is is uh, hyphenated. And maybe my favorite, keister plant. <laughs> keister plant. Uh, I mean, keister plant. Is, so your keister is your butt. So sitting, so passing out, over, ODing. Ryan, a keister plant are narcotics that are hidden up the rectum. Oh, oh, of course. 
And it th- this sounds like the kind of book that Flory Fisher would have had on her shelf. <laughs> <laughs> or she would have been a contributor to this publication. Mm-hmm. In 1972, Landy founded the Free Clinic in Beverly Hills. And that's an acronym, free. Clinic in Beverly Hills, where his methods were the house style. It was not free of charge. Free stood for Foundation for Rechanneling of Emotions and Education. Pretty sloppy acronym. He also began, Brian, to consult on television programs, Hmm. including one of the greatest sitcoms of its or any era. So he's a therapist. What 1970s sitcom do you think he consulted with the most? Oh, I assume Bob Newhart. The Bob Newhart Show, that's correct. He courted entertainment personalities as clients, among them Alice Cooper, the man, not the whole band, actors Rod Steiger, Richard Harris, Maureen McCormick. She's, uh, she Marsha? I think she's Marsha from Mm -hmm. the Brady Bunch. And Gig Young. You remember Gig Young? Remember the name. Yeah. Uh, Gig Young, someone once said uh, that my uh, acting style reminded them of Gig Young. And and I hope I hope it was is that a good uh, thing? <laughs> well, it it is Thank for the you. acting part, but not for what comes next. The McCormick and Young treatments did not go well. McCormick was being treated for a variety of addictions, bulimia, and depression. She claimed Landy overprescribed medications for her, making her depression and addictions worse. Gig Young, an alcoholic of long standing, had lost more than a few jobs because of his addiction. He was replaced with Gene Wilder as the Waco kid in Mel Brooks' 1975 Blazing Saddles. And he lost the role of the unseen Charlie in the TV show Charlie's Angels at the very last minute to John Forsyth, all all because of his drinking problem. Now, Young was one of uh, Landy's clients, and Young eventually killed his fifth wife, Kim Schmidt, in the couple's New York apartment and then turned the murder weapon, a handgun, on himself. The couple had been married for three weeks. Hmm. It is crucial to note here that I am not suggesting a connection to Landy's therapy and the murder-suicide, or for that matter, taking Maureen McCormick's side on this issue, but this seems to be important to medical licensing officials, as I will discuss down the line. And uh, this was one of those stories that was a bit too long for one episode, but as I broke it up, a bit too short. So this is a shorty because we're going to stop here. For Eugene Landy, part one, a story that I'm calling The Doctor is Far Out. (laughs) We'll continue next week with Landy's most famous and notorious doctor-patient relationship with Eugene Landy, part two, Hang On to Your Ego. All right. And that will get us started in the, at the very least, interesting career of Dr. Eugene Landy. Awesome. Thank you. Never heard of this dude. Well, um, I hadn't either until Marvin pointed him out to me. He said, you really should do this. And um, it gets it gets more fun next week. Let's just put okay. it that. Well, fun is a relative term, I guess. <laughs> so, folks, if you're out there, and I'll give the sources follow of this next time, because I've got quite a few sources for this story. Uh, so the next time, folks, if you're really feeling bad about something and you want to get some help, go ahead and fish head for the piddle. Mm -hmm. Uh, get that keister plant taken care of you (laughs) you want to get that flea powder out of your system and uh, even though you've been supporting your local travel agent and by all means give that orderly who helps you in the hospital or the doctor or the nurse give them a hand slap when they (laughs) uh, when they help you get off get off your drugs and that is it for my part of the episode nice sweet so more coming soon thank you more coming soon part two next week all right I think, that, I think that's it for this week thanks for listening folks we appreciate it um just a reminder give us five stars on whichever platform you're listening to us on shoot us a review and check us out at dreamidiots.com we are at dream idiots on facebook and instagram send us an email dream idiots podcast at gmail and um actually there's going to be some more content going up on our youtube channel here as well here soon so watch all of that and let us know what you think Yes, indeed. And uh, be good to each other, please.